professor madhavan uh, vardharajan from theoretical physics he works on various aspects of classical and quantum gravity and today he'll be telling us about quantum gravity a view from general relativity so thanks to the organizers for uh, giving me this chance to speak a little bit about the field i work in i don't know who the organizers are because i get emails from platinum jubilee committee and uh, but but thank you everyone and thank you for all the you know all the support staff and everyone for uh, for doing this uh, it's really a nice idea so uh, my field is quantum gravity similar to sumati's field and uh, quantum gravity is an ongoing effort to construct a quantum mechanical description of the physics of the gravitational field so all non gravitational interactions like the strong weak nuclear force electromagnetism etc uh, we know very well how to express in quantum mechanical language and in fact that story is really the story of the standard model of particle physics however uh, the gravitational interaction has escaped all attempts to make it consistent with quantum mechanics and uh, in this talk what i'll do is i'll try and tell you why it has escaped these efforts there are certain things about gravity which make it very different from other interactions non gravitational interactions and i'll try and tell you about these you know the kind of unique uh, conceptual and technical problems which come up when one tries to address the problem of quantum gravity and in discussing these conceptual and technical issues my whole perspective will be informed by my training as a general relativist and so that's why i have this title quantum gravity a view from general relativity and it's only towards the end of the talk that i might very broadly specify what sort of work i'm doing in but the question itself is quite fascinating so i hope you'll uh, you'll uh, find it interesting okay so uh as i said i'm a general relativist first and so i will first tell you a little bit about classical gravity and again if things are too trivial please tell me to go faster if you want clarification stop me but i thought i'd uh, sort of attune it to maybe even undergraduate students of which i don't think there are any here uh, so in any case you can hurry me along so first i'll talk a little bit about classical gravity which is a theory uh, einstein's theory of general relativity and the main message i want you to take away from this for what is going to happen later is that classical gravity is really a theory of space time itself it is not a theory which evolves in a given space time unlike other interactions non gravitational interactions after that i will repeat a little bit what sumati said about uh, when one expects quantum gravitational effects to become important and as we'll see and as we have already seen in her talk these effects become important at unimaginably high energy scales or unimaginably small distance scales and they seem to be not there's no hope of direct access to these energy scales so it is a legitimate question as to why one would engage in such a study so i'll say a little bit about that uh, reasons for studying quantum gravity uh, and then revisit the possible contact with observations so although it's it's sort of just it's it's very very difficult to have observational contact but but maybe we are almost there in the beginnings of some sort of quantum gravity phenomenology after that i'll very briefly list the approaches to quantum gravity and then tell you a little bit about the approach i work in which is called loop quantum gravity okay so this is kind of very elementary but let me let me get started so in you know most astrophysical applications i think newtonian gravity is good enough and the newtonian picture is that gravity is a force like any other force however a more accurate description is of course einstein's theory of general relativity and this signals a a, a big paradigm shift from viewing gravity as a force to gravity as space time geometry itself and typically you know you you would have seen these things for those who have not taken a gr course just in the popular exposition that if you take the newtonian view of the earth moving around the sun the earth has a gravitational force and it holds it in orbit 
On the other hand, if you take the Einsteinian view, then the sun distorts the geometry around it and the earth moves as straight as possible on what is called a geodesic and it appears to us as if it is a curved motion. And of course, these theories completely agree with each other for weak gravitational fields. Uh, but if you are going to look at very accurate measurements for weak gravitational fields or if you are going to look at the physics of extremely strong gravitational fields, then general relativity is the correct theory. Right. So, when you say the from the geometry perspective, the art moves in a straight line in the geodesic. So, it moves with a constant velocity or… So, that, that depends uh, on the curvature of the… You know, you can go back and forth between these two pictures okay. for weak gravitational fields and you can derive Newtonian theory as a, you know, weak field limit of the Einstein uh, uh, equations. Okay. And it, it depends on the source, okay. right. So, because so there is no force, right, now in the right. geometry picture. So, so what happens? In, in Newtonian theory, you have some uh, conglomeration of matter, right, some, some configuration of matter and then you can work out what the gravitational, net gravitational force is on some particle and then you can find its orbit. So now the Einstein equations relate similarly the matter content, you know, and the configuration of matter to the curvature of the geometry. And so in a similar way, it depends on whatever is the matter source and how it is arranged, the geometry will react in that particular way and you will have an orbit which is going as straight on a geodesic as possible. So it, it, it it's entirely parallel, right. So whatever is the matter content and how it's uh, configured will determine how the object moves around, uh, a test particle moves in that geometry. Uh, so uh, what mathematical object characterizes this geometry? So that's the first question to ask before we get on to the theory. And uh, let's instead of going to space time, let's go to a very simple uh, case of two dimensions and that to just spatial like you know the surface of this table. And it turns out that of course, uh, I mean the answer is that the, the, the thing which characterizes geometry is the distance between any point and its nearby point. So let me say a little bit more of that. So if I have, I am given the geometry of say this table, then certainly I know if I take two points, a point here and a point close by, I know what the distance is, I know the distance to points, all, all, all points nearby. So you are given the geometry, I know the distance, but you can also go conversely, right. And in fact, in this case, the distance is just, uh, you know, just dl square is, if I have x and y coordinates, Cartesian coordinates, then it is just uh, dl square is equal to dx square plus dy square, where the points are separated x, y to, right, between these two points. But now I can go conversely and of course this thing is completely flat, but I can go conversely. So what I can do is I can say, uh, imagine a plane worth of points, so, so, so you just have a bunch of points which occupy a plane, but you do not know their distance relation. Okay, so it is kind of a weird conceptual thing. You just have a bunch, infinite number of points which occupy two dimensions. And then I tell you, now I am going to paint a distance function on it. So I am going to tell you that a point and infinitesimally uh, points which are uh, located infinitesimal to it have a distance which is exactly given by this. And if you want to arrange the points, in such a way that the distance function is given by this, you will find that uniquely these points will occupy exactly the distance structure of the plane, okay. So the distance function is determined by the geometry and given the distance function, the geometry is fixed. So let us do another example. For the sphere, the geometry is a bit different, right. And now if I take a, a, a sphere worth of points where I just give you the angular uh, values, theta and phi, and I try to arrange all these points such that the point, the distance between any two nearby points at theta phi and theta plus d theta and phi plus d phi is exactly this with capital R equal to some fixed constant, then you will find that 
you have no option except to arrange these points in a spherical geometry with radius r. And the radius r of course determines the curvature, so this is a curved geometry. So depending on what sort of metric I give, so this, this function, this distance function is called the metric. And determine, de depending on what kind of metric I give you, you can either have a flat geometry or you can have a curved geometry. So this is all uh, for the, for the uh, you know, two dimensional thing. Um, but we can do something similar, just mathematically one can go to uh, three dimensions or any dimensions in space, but we can also go to space time. So similarly, the geometry of space time, which is what underlies, uh, that is the basic variable, dynamical variable for Einstein's theory, is the space time distance from any point to its nearby points. So for example, if we are looking at special relativity, where there is no gravitational field, the gravitational field is zero, you find, as you all know, the distance between a point, which is, so you have now a four dimensional worth of points, right, which have coordinates x, y, z, t, and I look at x plus dx, y plus dy, z plus dz, t plus dp, so infinitesimally close to x, y, z, t, and I paint this particular distance function. And the difference between space and space time is that you have this negative sign over here. But again, this is just a distance between these two points. And if I arrange these points so that nearby points have this distance, then I get really the structure of space time from special relativity. And because you have a minus sign over here, then depending on how big your temporal separations are compared to your spatial separations, this distance can be negative if the temporal separation is larger than the spatial separation, or it can be zero in which case c squared dt squared is exactly equal to the distance separation and that just means that you are going at the speed of light because c is the speed of light over here or if the spatial separation outweighs uh, the temporal separation then you need to be able to travel faster than light to get to that and light is really the ultimate speed limit. So these kind of space like or positive uh, distance separated objects you cannot communicate with each other. Right? So only things which are time-like or light-like can communicate with each other. So you can see that the distance function which you put or the metric in the case of space-time geometry has information about what Sumati talked about yesterday which is the causal structure, which events can influence which other in events. So it is, it gives you a lot of rich information about uh, 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 you know, not only geometry but also the causal structure. And again, if I arrange uh, the network of distances between all these points to satisfy this relation, you will find in a compu computable sense that the space-time geometry, I can compute its curvature in a certain manner and the space-time geometry is flat, it is not curved, right. But of course, you can mathematically conceive of putting these points together in with a certain distance function which results in a curved space-time geometry and that is a curved space-time geometry which one is interested in when there is a gravitational field. Before going to that, let me just draw this diagram because it is going to be useful for later on. So in flat space-time, uh, as I said, this is the uh, metric and geometry determines causal structure. So if I have a point over here, I have just suppressed one uh, z direction. I have x, y and t, a point over here and then I look at points which are light like separated where c square d, dt square or c square t square is equal to the distance separation. So this is exactly the surface of the light cone over here. These are the points where which are light like separated. The guys which are time like separated have bigger temporal separation than spatial separation and so they all lie within the light cone. So this the stuff inside here is what you can influence and the stuff which influences this guy can all lie over here, right. So these points can communicate with this and this point can communicate with these guys. So however, if you are looking at something over here, these guys can never communicate with each other. There is no physical process which will manage for you to communicate from here to here. Let me go back to curved geometry. So in general relativity, this network of distances between pairs of nearby points in space-time can constitute a curved geometry. 
And once again, it turns out that nearby points can be time-like, space-like or light-like separated. And so, causal structure is again part of the information which you get out once you specify the geometry or once you spe specify the metric. So, just to say that, um, you know, general relativity, it sounds like a very uh, esoteric concept, but it actually has applicability, not so much applicability, but, but you, if you did not uh, account for general relativity, then it would affect, yes. Madhavan, uh, maybe a very naive question. When you say causal structure, yes. are you meaning to say that for every effect there is a cause or anything, something beyond that? No, nothing. So, no. I am saying that when, when can some, uh, everything is located in space and time, right? So, you yes. have some event. Mm -hmm. when, when can that event possibly influence other events? Okay. In order to do that, this event has to communicate with the other event at best at the speed of light or yes. less than the speed of light. So, those events with which it can communicate through signals are events which it can influence. Yes. Now, depending on your particular theory, there might be electromagnetic radiation and they will only influence light like things or you might have scattering and or it depends on the theory as to which ones you can really influence in a particular theory, right. But in principle, the only events you can influence are those in your, with, within your future light cone and on the boundary. Okay, so, that is what I mean by causal structure, which are the events which a particular event is capable in principle of influencing. And there are events which you simply, with this event cannot influence no matter what theory you have and those are the ones which are space-like related to it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So, what about general relativity in daily life? So, this is the, the GPS which is in all your smartphones and cars and so on and so forth. Um, so, to understand why general relativity plays a role in the GPS, note that the duration between the ticks of a clock is time like distance, right? The same position in space, and so the clicks of a talk, uh, click, <laughs> the ticks of a clock <laughs> or the clicks of a clock <laughs> are uh, constitute a time like distance, and we know that time like distance is everything is related by the geometry, right? So, depending on the geometry, you, you will compute uh, this time like distance. So, therefore, the rate of ticking really depends on the gravitational field because that depends on the curvature. And therefore, clocks which are say far away from Earth on satellites will tick slightly differently from clocks which are on Earth according to the theory of GR if you believe GR. If you, now, how does the GPS work? Very briefly, you have in your smartphone, you have a, a receiver and this receiver you need four coordinates, right? Your x, y, z, t. So, in principle, if you have four satellites located appropriately and you know you receive pulses from these satellites, you know when the pulse has uh, been emitted, there is a timestamp whenever these pulses come and you know when it is received and you can invert uh, the, the fact that you are coincident with these four pulses, you can invert and you can get your space-time coordinates and your location. So, that is essentially how the GPS works. But then, in order to invert this, you need to actually have a theoretical estimate of the relation between the satellite clocks and the terrestrial clocks because, because it is all in the timing. And if we did not account for GR, then it turns out you would make a wrong calculation and your receiver would give you a wrong position. And if these clocks were synchronized to start out with, then in a matter of minutes, you would basically lose information about your position. A few minutes for the military and like 30 minutes for civilian purposes because they have different uh, accuracies. So, it is actually, it is real. I mean, every time you compute your position, GR is playing a very significant role. It is not just some esoteric theory. There is curvature of space time. It affects the way clocks tick over there. It affects the way clocks tick here. And this is, this is real, right? Just like nowadays, you know, quantum mechanics is everywhere. You have quantum dot TVs and so on. Similarly, here GR is actually real and, and 
it is part of our everyday fabric. It is not just some, some exotic theory. Okay. So, now hopefully having convinced you that space time curvature and GR and all these things are, are very, very real, let us do a thought experiment and let us just switch off the gravitational field. Now, if you switch off the gravitational field, you have no curvature. So, you just have the fixed flat space time of special relativity and the dynamics of all non-gravitational things like matter and light and their quantum fluctuations, quantum mechanics everything unfolds in this fixed space-time arena. Now, I can switch on classical gravity. So, the space-time arena becomes curved, but conceptually again the dynamics of matter and light and their quantum fluctuations now simply unfold on this curved arena, but it is a fixed arena. And finally, I can now switch on quantum gravity. Once you switch on quantum mechanics, the basic dynamical variables of your theory acquire quantum fluctuations and uncertainties like position, momenta, etc. In this case, our basic dynamical variable are these grids of spatio-temporal separations determined by the metric and these start fluctuating right? and exactly as Sumati said, you know, a, a very a nice picture is that what was a firm stage where everything evolved, all the actors played their roles now comes and it joins in the play. So, light cones start becoming fuzzy because all, all everything is fluctuating and classical space time loses its meaning. And therefore, if you want to confront quantum gravity, it is actually a quantum mechanics of space time itself not a quantum mechanics in space time. And if you start thinking about it already, you kind of lose, you know, all this firm foundation where you are sitting and you just do not know what is going on, right. And this is really the principal conceptual difficulty in quantum gravity, which makes it so hard to, to make progress. It is so different from other theories. Yeah. space volumes in quantum mechanics are fairly well defined, uh, yeah. wh whereas the dynamical variables are not necessarily uh, well yeah. so, defined. So, in fact, this is, uh, this, is, this is an approach which goes under the parlance in other theories, right, called canonical quantization, Hamiltonian quantization and this is precisely what underlies the approach which I, I, I practice, which I will, so I will come to that towards the end of the talk, yeah. how they are fluctuating their position that is why you are calling out the fluctuation. Yeah, so there is no grid I am dividing, right. I am telling you that uh, the gravitational field is, is, it is not, it is actually the gravitational field is the geometry of space time. In order to tell you the geometry of space time, I need to know the spatial and temporal separations between nearby points. So, this is the variable which will fluctuate. Right, it is subject to quantum fluctuations, right. So, you, you know, you are no, but, but this has very profound, uh, you know, conceptual sort of, you, you get into real problems, right. You do not even know whether, you know, event A can influence event B because now everything is fuzzy, right. Your, your light cones are fuzzy, right. So, every, it, it, it just becomes extremely complicated and I will tell you even technically why it becomes complicated as we go along uh, with the talk, okay. Yeah. mentioned that clocks are uh, ticking differently. Yeah. So, it is like with respect to each other, right? Because in Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely correct. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. in satellite, if someone is sitting like... Uh, then, then you won't have it, yeah. right? So, what you need to do really is to have a, a kind of uniform uh, notion of yes. time where you can, you can connect what is happening there with what is happening here and you can do that and, and we can talk more about it. Yes. And in fact, there is a, a very nice... Uh, series of articles by Neil Ashby, uh, who if you know special relativity, mm. then that is enough and it is really beautiful. He has a physics today article and then he has the living reviews article 
where it's you can look at it in all sorts it's very confusing so it's not trivial at all and even in the gps itself there is lot of room for confusion so uh, as to what synchronization means how exactly does it happen uh, earlier uh, it was more or less measured you know what the time differences were uh, through frequency changes in the atomic clocks on the satellites uh, but nowadays there are factory offsets which automatically take the synchronization into account and so on but it's a fascinating topic in its own right yeah thanks in that context i wanted to ask this uh, question see clocks are of different kinds yes see now we have this crystal clocks i mean all the digital stuff so when we say that the time is dilated we can imagine that the frequency of the crystal changes basically but uh, imagine this spring clock like you know the grandfather clock which has a spring in there and you are taking that clock out there away from the surface of the earth so uh, 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 einstein gravity demands that i mean see because the time as measured by such a clock is because of the temper of, uh, of yeah. the spring yeah. so this has to change isn't no, it no no time itself will change so so you cannot if you are only looking at hmm. you are on the satellite yeah, you are only looking there you you don't know anything as no what, what, said. what i'm saying is my no. my so so i'll just let me finish right okay. uh. so if you are just on the satellite hmm. you don't know anything i hmm. mean hmm. time your your spring everything local physics is the same hmm. okay everything hmm. is the same you cannot same. distinguish between hmm. it's only when you make a comparison between what is happening between the clock the yeah. same spring clock if you look locally on the earth it will yeah. also operate with the same principles correct the, nothing is changing with the spring constant or anything okay, okay. but what is happening is that the very notion of time hmm. when you compare the two hmm. has changed so okay because of the gravitational field hmm. so suppose the and, clock and in order to do that you have to set up a comparison and that is that that requires a little more effort so so if you just sit on earth you just sit on the satellite you don't know any difference you, yeah, you that, cannot see. that i understand yes so the question is like let's say the spring moves 100 times to really you know make one minute one hour or something so uh, if you compare so when you have when one hour has gone on the earth surface maybe like 58 minutes has gone up there so for only for 58 minutes to go up there the spring has spring cannot make all the 100 turns hmm. okay yes hmm definition of a time correct the interval an interval yes it mm. dilates right you have mm. this notion of the twin paradox and mm. so on mm. if you can it's the same thing in effect mm. except of course now you have curvature and so on but if it can happen there it definitely can happen in gr so if if you can resolve that question within special relativity <laughs> <laughs> okay times, okay it is not is it, it is a very Hmm. i mean it's it's a it's a good question and to give a full answer even i will have to go back and think right hmm. the main problem is how do you compare the time over hmm. there hmm. with the time over here hmm. and that means that you have you have to have a kind of a universal time yeah. right which is yeah. where hmm. and with respect to that you you say something yeah. so we can talk about this more in the coffee yeah program. i would actually think that the winding process itself become slower somehow anyway but no, but slower hmm. only it's, when you look at no, it when you compare yes when you no, compare when you compare yes when you compare there is no absolute time but when you compare yes yes okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. but then how do you compare right so uh, we get into those sort of things right yes. you have to send light yeah something signal okay so we'll we'll talk about it yeah, it's, it's a if you if you in fact uh, forget as sumati says forgetting about gr if you look at you know einstein's paper on Uh, special relativity actually the title has nothing to do with special it, it, the title is on the electrodynamics of moving bodies there is no special relativity in it and the first section or two sections of the paper is just trying to set up a coordinate system and synchronizing you know clocks and putting them here and there through light beams so it is by no no means a simple process and if you ask me off the top of my head to tell you what happens i am not 
you know i can think about it and come back to you and tell you right but it is a confusing topic mother and i have a small, yeah, sure. uh, maybe um, trivial for you to answer or related not so if you go back to your diagram where you had the two cones uh, so, uh, the forward looking ah yeah yes so where do we place the satellite clock and where do we place the ground in 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 this kind of a diagram is it relevant at all so this this diagram is uh, is one of flat space time okay right where um, kind of the geometry is the same everywhere okay, okay. so, so uh, what curve, i would do uh, in curve, the satellite right. case is that they would, I, I i don't know how i would draw it because it would be some four dimensional geometry but the light cone structure on the earth and the light cone structure at the satellite will be different and i think uh, when i come if there is uh, i'm going very slowly but eventually i'll come to black holes and there there is a dramatic effect of curvature where you will try and you will probably get a better idea of what i'm saying okay. you'll see the diagram in an extreme situation where you will really be able to see what i mean so so maybe we can wait till that and yeah, then sure, we can sure. discuss it later thank you Madhavan, can yeah. I, sorry, to slow yeah, you yeah. down even more. No, no, I uh, don't mind, but your lunch will go. I mean, that's the, all. <laughs> the, okay, so while we are on the question of satellites and, you know, synchronicity and stuff like that. So now we are entering the era where there are going to be several satellites which are going to be used for quantum key distributions and so on up there. One of the way that this entire system works is that you do entanglement swapping or something of that sort between two ground based stuff you go up and you uh, synchronize things and i mean you 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 make a um, measurement on the satellite okay and uh, you essentially correlate the two photons which are non measured now the point in this kind of a situation is that if the i mean are there sources etc which how does gr and whatever you are kind of uh, talking about how is this expected to impact such issues because there are out these there are companies out there which are putting up satellites for precisely this i'm just wondering whether that I requires anything additional to yeah, yeah but no conceptually i don't think there's anything there's further th there's nothing further there's nothing further conceptually i, I don't think so okay right because again yeah it's just quantum mechanics on on some fixed space time and i don't know it depends on the detailed technicalities about how they are doing these measurements but you know i mean i don't think there is any conceptual uh, issue with regard to quantum mechanics and entanglement okay maybe in the nitty gritty of what they do they may have to account for some things right but it depends you know it really depends on what what you are trying to do and what accuracy you want in various things right so here there are all sorts of corrections there are corrections due to special relativistic doppler shifts right like what sumati was saying relative just special relativity about time over there and time over here but the gr contribution is comparable to the special relativistic doppler shift this thing and it's in the opposite opposite sign so 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 it's significant okay so um let me uh, so i want to remind you that uh, quantum gravity is conceptually very confusing and i hope i have made that point i mean already classical gravity with all these questions as you can see is already very confusing when you want to talk about synchronization and other things and quantum gravity now is an added layer where you make things subject to quantum fluctuation so i mean who knows what you are going to be doing right so okay now let me change gears a little bit and uh, repeat what sumati was saying in her last talk let us try and estimate when so quantum gravity effects are not important in this room right and for the physics we do so when are they going to be important and to get a handle on that we look at the theories which are basically going to be united when you talk about quantum gravity so general relativity is a relativistic theory so the velocity of light plays a role there it's a generalization of newtonian gravity so you have newton's constant and quantum mechanics is characterized by h bar uh, planck's constant so you can combine these as somati said yesterday and you can get objects which are dimension full they have the dimensions of length time energy and uh, just to pick one of them if you are looking at okay so the length scale is 10 to the minus 33 centimeters 
uh, I think a nuclear size is like 10 to the minus 14 meters, right? So, I mean, it's it's like just unimaginably small. Or if you look at the Planck energy, it's 10 to the 19 GeV, and the biggest accelerator, most powerful one we can construct is around 1000 GeV. So, they are 16 orders of magnitude away from, and, and so one can just forget about it. We are not going to be able to uh, ever broach directly this energy frontier. So, now if you know, this is all seems to be very academic and uh, who cares? I mean, you are not ever going to be able to directly confront this. So, why worry? So, let me give you a couple of reasons which resonate this is why Sumati and I do this sort of stuff. And the first, and, and this is kind of expanding on what she said yesterday. Um, the first reason is singularity. So, what, what, what do I mean? Instead of the you know Newtonian equations for gravity, now we have as when we talked with Sanjeev, we have the Einstein equations. The basic variable of geometry is this metric. So, there are some differential equations which tell you the curvature of space time from this metric and that is related to the energy momentum of matter. This is just like the gravitational force would be driven by the mass. In this case, it is relativistic. So, you have an energy momentum tensor and you have a curvature and there is an equality between the two and these constitute the Einstein equations. And what is the solution of the Einstein equations? The solution of the Einstein equations is a single in general curved space time geometry with matter on it. Okay? So, that is what, what a solution would be. The matter, so, it is a whole space time and matter fields on it. So, it tells you the dynamics of the matter, it tells you the dynamics of geometry. Um, now, if I look at the solution describing the space time geometry of our universe at large scales, so if I look um, at very large distance scales, which means I look back very far away in time, then it turns out uh, that things look very homogeneous. So, if I look in this part of the sky, that part of the sky, things look very homogeneous and isotropic and the homogeneous and isotropic solution of the Einstein equations is called the Friedman Robertson Walker solution. And if you take this kind of geometry as we observe it now and you look at the Einstein equations and evolve this geometry back in time, then you find that as you go back in time, the curvatures described by this geometry become larger and larger and larger until you go back in time to a, a point in space and time where the curvature blows up. So, the equations are partial differential equations, you can solve them with some initial conditions and go propagate them back backwards in time and one has to be careful about what means one, one what one means by time, but in this particular Friedman Robertson Walker solution because of the symmetry there is a good notion of time. So, when you go back you find the same these Einstein equations tell you that the curvature blows up you have infinity. Now, whenever you have infinity in a physical theory, it usually means that you are pushing the theory beyond its domain of validity. Okay. So, uh, this kind of uh, geometry where, where the curvature completely blows up, everything is infinite, densities blow up because there is matter also, this is called uh, a singularity and this simply sing signals the breakdown of classical general relativity. Now, before the curvature becomes infinite, it will pass through an epoch where the curvature becomes 1 over 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. That is, it will approach the Planck scale. The energies will, energy densities will go up to the Planck and at that stage you would expect quantum mechanics to become important. Right? So, can quantum gravity resolve the Big Bang singularity? Maybe there are quantum effects which can then give a completion because right now our physical theory is incomplete. We do not know, it just breaks down and therefore, if we want to understand nature, we have to complete our understanding. At present, the equations predict their own demise and in the early days, it was thought that this is perhaps a, a, an artifact of the high level of symmetry you impose that there is homogeneous isotropic fields. So, they have very little, few degrees of freedom. If maybe if you put in inhomogeneities and anisotropies, etcetera, 
these singularities, they're very fine-tuned and they would just go away and you wouldn't need to worry about it. But uh, uh, there is work, in fact, Penrose's paper in 1965, for which he got the Nobel Prize, uh, he shared it with Andrea Guess and, and uh, what's the other guy's name? Uh, forgotten. Anyway, there was just two, two, two Nobel Prizes ago, I think. Roger Penrose got it for one paper. It's a 1965 paper. Actually, it would be interesting to talk about that, in, you know. And this was the first of the singularity theorems. It says that under very generic circumstances, either going forward or back in time, you have a singularity. So these are not artifacts of symmetry, these singularities are ubiquitous in general relativity, which means that general relativity itself is an incomplete theory and we would like to, as physicists, understand what is a complete description of our universe, right? So this is why one reason to study GR, yeah, uh, to study quantum gravity, right? Resolve the singularity or it will just push the gravities little bit closer to the Big Bang? Well, what we are, uh, so, so we don't know, right? Okay. We don't know. But what we would like as physicists is to have a complete theory, yeah. right? Yeah. And we know that our current theory is incomplete. Yeah. Yeah. We also know that at some point we have neglected something which are quantum effects of gravity. So it's a question. So, suppose so can quantum gravity be the completion of our understanding. It would be if it completely eliminated the singularity. So, so if but it, we don't know. We have to check. Okay. So this is the motivation for studying quantum gravity. So suppose it eliminates the singularity. Yes. Then it's a smooth point, right? Yeah. So now does it make sense to ask about let's say what is beyond uh, before yes. Big Bang or negative time yes, or something like? Yes, it does. It it does, and and we'll come to it. Okay. So if we ever get there. Uh, Again, it's towards the end of my talk, which I will be, to, but yeah, these are all the questions which, which come up, right? So right now the Big Bang is not a Big Bang in space-time, it is just a Big Bang at which space and time come into being. And if you don't have that Big Bang, then you can ask what comes before and we can talk about that. Yeah. So the, 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 the effect of uh, this quantum nature, you would expect that, uh, you said that, uh, you know, it's, it may not uh, be apparent in anything we measure, but still uh, it should be apparent, as you mentioned, close to the Big Bang. Yes. Uh, so are there effects like, for example, in the cosmic uh, yeah. ray So I'll come to that. So all these things I'll come to. Yeah, I'll come to in, in some, I'm not an expert on CMBR. Uh, Tarun is not here, so he would have been able to, you know, fill in some gaps. Uh, but but I'll come to it maybe <laughs> if you if you miss lunch <laughs> then I'll come to it. Um, so let me come to reason number two, which is also very fascinating, which was also alluded to uh, in Sumati's talk. Um, reason number two is black holes, and I don't mean the astrophysical properties of black holes like uh, uh, Biswajit and uh, other people were talking about. I really mean uh, something about what, what happens inside black holes, you know, and, 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 and from a very uh, theoretical point of view, rather than a, a what happens outside and accretion and so on. Okay, so let me go to that. Now in GR, like in special relativity, as I said, the speed of propagation is limited by that of light. So one can think of a geometry which is so curved, such that there is a part of space-time and, and the curvature is such that light rays cannot come out of this region. And I'll, I'll show you diagrammatically in, in the next slide. So that will also maybe give you a little bit of intuition of what I was saying about the satellite clocks. Um, now, if you had such a thing, then this region would not be able to send signals outside. So it would be black. Things could fall inside. So it would be a hole, right? And so these things, I think John Wheeler coined uh, the word black hole. So there are actually solutions to the Einstein equations with exactly such behavior. Right? In fact, the first solution was found by Schwarzschild while on his deathbed, I think the story goes, while he was, uh, yeah, before he popped off, he found this or something like that, right? So I don't know the exact history, Sumati can correct me, but there is a, a story about this. And of course, at that stage, you know, the structure was not known in detail, but it is kind of the first solution, uh, black hole solution. Okay, so what is this black hole geometry? Just pictorially, what I've drawn over here are the light cones, 
exactly those light cones. So locally the light cones look exactly like I had drawn them. It's just that when you go from point to point, they, they change. In the flat space time I drew, there was no curvature, the light cones would look the same everywhere. But here what happens is that I look at some region over here. So this is supposed to be a spherical region. I have just drawn it as a disk suppressing one dimension. Right? So there is a, if I look over here and I look at the light cones over here, they are pointing this way. right? So light can get out because remember light, anything can travel only within the local light cone. Okay? Otherwise it, it's space like it goes faster than the speed of light. So over here things are confined, they can go out. But as I come inside the black hole closer and closer, the curvature of the geometry is making the light cones tip like this. Okay? So if I go inside the black hole, then the, there is no option. Anything which moves inside the light cone has to go and hit this place of infinite curvature called the singularity. So deep inside the black hole, there is a singularity, but all, all the light cones are tipped towards the singularity. So you have no option. The geometry is such that it forces you to go and die. Okay? But right at the boundary between the inside and the outside, you have a light cone structure like this, where there are rays which just about make it out to infinity. Okay? So they are just tilted so much that some of the rays get out. Okay? And these set of rays are what we call the black hole horizon. So this is the boundary of the black hole. Anything which falls inside the horizon is doomed to die. right? And nothing can come outside because the light cones are all tipping this way. And that is just curvature. And it is not necessary for large black holes like the supermassive black holes in the center of galaxies and so on. The curvatures here are not large. Okay, so the local gravitational tidal forces are not large. They can be for a large enough black hole, they can be as small as you want. You may not even notice them. But inevitably, because the light cone structure is such, you will slowly find yourself, you know, <laughs> going and hitting the singularity. And as you go in, inside more and more, the tidal forces will become more and more and more. Okay? So, uh, so that is what, what a black hole is. Now, this thing which is the event horizon, this was supposed to be a sphere. Okay? This guy was supposed to be a sphere and it is a spherical wavefront. Right? So you have spherical wavefront here, here, here. So there is a horizon and there is this spherical wavefront which is just about managing to go out to infinity. And the area of that sphere is what you can compute. Right? So it is a two dimensional at any fixed time, it is a two dimensional uh, surface. So the event horizon is three dimensional with two dimensional cross sections. Technically it's called a null, it's what's called a null surface, right? But it has these two dimensional cross sections and as I will discuss on the next uh, slide, the area of these cross sections encode a completely mysterious connection with thermodynamics. So com different subject, okay? So we are GR, we are geometry, all this and then you have thermodynamics which is, you know, what what a lot of you do and are used to. Um, so what is this connection? So this started I think uh, a long time ago in a paper by Bardeen, Carter and Hawking and what they looked at were these Kerr solutions which are a class of exact solutions which describe rotating black holes. They are stationary solutions and they are characterized by their mass and their angular momentum. So they simply looked at these solutions. You can write them down right? and you can, you can ask well so you know everything about these solutions and you can ask, you know where the horizon is, you know all the geometry. So you, what they did is they considered the mass of uh, a black hole mathematically of mass m and angular momentum j. And they considered simply another black hole solution which had mass m plus delta m and angular momentum j plus delta j. And because of the Einstein equations, they tell you what the geometry is like inside, it turns out what they found was that the change in mass was equal to the change in area times what is called the surface gravity of the black hole. Right? So the surface gravity of this black hole of mass m is kappa. So that's something you can compute from the solution. Okay? Plus omega which is the, uh, the uh, angular speed of the black hole because it is rotating omega times dj. 
right, the change in angular momentum. So this is just parameters of two nearby stationary solutions, but they arrange themselves into a form which is very reminiscent of the first law of thermodynamics, right, where the area would play the role of entropy, kappa would play the role of temperature, and you have this extra term which is analogous to work done, okay. So here, now, uh, I don't know exactly the chronology, but Bekenstein took this very seriously. I don't know whether he looked at this or he had his own, own, own ideas, um, but Bekenstein, uh, I think he was a student of Wheeler and my own, I mean, the person, my mentor, Abhay Ashtekar says that it's one of the, uh, I think, if not one of the, maybe the best and most interesting thesis on gravity that he has ever read. Uh, so he did this PhD work and what basically he was doing was they saying, okay, there's a black hole and let me, so he was motivated to think of black holes as thermodynamic objects and he said, well, there's a black hole and I have some box of gas or something which has entropy which lies outside the black hole. So I take this box of gas and I throw it inside the black hole. So now it's gone, right? And entropy in my accessible air part of the universe has reduced. So have I violated the second law of thermodynamics? And what he found was that what you can do is, well, you can say, now you've thrown in the, the entropic object which had some mass. So the mass of the black hole is increased. And then from the Einstein equations, you can compute when the mass of the black hole is increased and settled down to a new mass, what is the increase or change in the area of its horizon? You can compute that. And what Bekenstein found, I mean, he really tried hard. His papers, early papers, many of them are just throwing stuff into the black hole of various kinds, you know, of entropic objects and really trying to violate the second law. What he found was that if he looked at the combination of the area divided by some unknown factor, he didn't know what this factor was exactly. He knew roughly to an order of mag uh, up to a co numerical coefficient of order one just through his, his thought experiments, plus the ex exterior entropy always increased, okay. So what, what were the inputs to this? There was the Einstein equations which told you once the mass of the black hole changes, what is the change in the area of, of its horizon and there is something completely unrelated which is thermodynamics. So he tried to maximize the entropy with minimizing the mass in the objects he threw in, but he always find, found no matter how hard he tried that this particular combination always increased and so he termed this to be the generalized second law, right, and alpha turns out to be through his calculations almost equal to the Planck area, so 10 to the minus 33 centimeter whole square and this is what he called the generalized second law. So this is what his proposal was, that black holes have entropy, we don't know why, it's totally crazy because they are general relativistic objects which had nothing to do with thermodynamics. So we have a first law, we have a second law, in fact there is even an analog of the zeroth law, yeah. Outside the horizon, right, so, so you are outside the black hole okay. so right? and now you can only throw things inside the black hole, nothing can come out, right, so you throw something inside the so black hole. So you reduce entropy So outside. you reduce the entropy outside. So that's a negative. And that's a negative. Okay. So and the question is can you recover the second law in some form, yes you can if you assign entropy to the black hole and the beautiful thing is that you, you can assign it geometrically okay. because the black hole when you look from outside it basically has you know the area of its horizon is, is one of the obvious things which, which characterizes the black hole and that changes in just the right way to get the second law, generalized second law to work. So that's the another very trivial question, maybe I can just go back and <laughs> calculate again. Suppose uh, I just forget this angular momentum part. Yes. And I have a sphere and I put some mass there and keep the density constant. Uh, yes. How would the mass of the sphere and the, in, uh, dense, uh, the increase in the area depend? That's not the proportional there. Uh, no, it's, uh, so I'll tell you, it, I'll come to that. So it goes as the mass square. Mass square. Square. The area of the black hole goes as the mass square, but then you have but to geometrize uh, it with some Newton's uh, constant and uh, so on. But here I am just, just adding a ball, that is the classical thing and I am yes. just adding, adding some mass yes. and just 
We can so, eat again in uniform sphere. Basically. Right, but but general relativistically, right? No, oh, just oh, the no. neutron, just the take a ball and. Oh, then the then yeah and yeah I have not a, but a but little bit of mud there and something. Okay. Right. Okay, so, so we can. Huh? No, because the mass will completely uh, yeah. go into this thing. Is it, is it, uh, so is it volume or still the area? Area. Here it's the area, but, but there. Yeah, there is. Yeah. That's what the question. Uh, Here it's the area. So, so let me let me just yeah, come yeah. to the next slide. We can come back to your question because, I, yeah, it's not completely clear what the question is, yeah. but, but you'll see that this because of the the alpha over there, it's huge. The entropy of a you know an astrophysical black hole is just gigantic. Yeah, so let, let's go slowly. Let's, so already you are getting interested, right, in these puzzles. So that is why we find it so fascinating that they're completely disparate areas and you have these connections, right? Yeah. I can't wrap up. <laughs> I can stop. <laughs> I can just stop somewhere. That's fine by me. I, I don't have a problem with that. I am fine with anything, but uh, let me let me make a heroic effort to. So, so you say I have ten minutes. Let's see where we get in ten minutes. Huh? Let's see where we get in ten minutes. Then. Uh, Okay. Are you tomorrow? Yeah, and you will lose me also, maybe because I have to go for housewarming somewhere. <laughs> okay, let let's not waste time now. Let me do my best in ten minutes, and then we can see because then some technical things will happen. This is still the story of why Somathe and I are interested in quantum gravity and why it's a good thing to do. So let let let's go ahead. Okay, now uh, the next question. So these are all, you know, suspicions, right? They, they, they are suggestive of various things. Areas like entropy and black holes behave like thermodynamic systems, but classically black holes cannot radiate, right? The whole point of a black hole is that it does not allow anything to come out. Right? That is the whole definition of a black hole. So, if classically a black hole cannot radiate, it cannot be hot. How can it be a thermodynamic object? Right? So, it's all very well to say all this, but but why? What you know? It, it doesn't seem to have anything like a temperature associated with it. So, what Hawking did, and this is this is why his uh, his work is so famous. Although he his work rested on earlier work by Leonard Parker, who also made very groundbreaking breaking contributions, which were then taken up by Hawking and developed. Uh, Hawking considered quantum matter, so he didn't have, we don't have a theory of quantum gravity, but what he did was he looked at quantum matter fields propagating on a classical space time of a spherically symmetric black hole which has been formed by collapse. So you have some early matter, it collapses to form a black hole, settles down and on this initially you send quantum matter say in this vacuum state and you ask what happens. In the, distance, in the distant future. Now, in general, when you have time dependent fields, even you, you expect that there are particles are produced. And in this case, there is a collapsing situation with some time dependence. And what Hawking found was that this time dependent gravitational field produced particles, which is fine. But he could actually compute at late times what is the, the kind of spectrum of these particles, how what do they look like? And the distribution of these particles is thermal. This is what he found. So at late times, Hawking found that the black hole spontaneously emits, due to quantum effects, particles. And these particles are in a thermal uh, state, which is characterized by a temperature. right? And this temperature is, remember the kappa, which came as a, uh, in first law, which, which, which you know, Hawking, Bardeen, Carter just looked at that kappa multiplied because it's a quantum effect by h bar okay? and with appropriate g's etc and 
remember from that classical first law kappa dA is temperature times dS. So if, if we associate the temperature to be a, this thing, then it turns out that S is the area divided by h power and you put in a factor of g, that is how the calculations work out and then it becomes the black hole area divided by the Planck area. And if you put in the numbers for a solar mass black hole, uh, the temperature comes out to be absurdly small, right? 1 nano Kelvin with a huge entropy of 10 to the 60 ergs per Kelvin. Okay? So the story is now coming more and more that on the one hand you have GR, on the other hand you have quantum field theory and then you have statistical mechanics and all these three fields seem to be talking to each other in some weird way and making things happen which you never thought would happen. Right? So why does this happen? Right? No, so I am coming to that. Right? So now what happens, once you switch on your these quantum effects, if you, you look at what the kappa is and the kappa turns out to be proportional to 1 over the mass. So what happens? You radiate, the mass goes down, the temperature goes up, you radiate more. The specific heat is negative. A black hole, a spherically symmetric black hole has negative specific heat. But you can compute, you know, because the temperature is so small, the process is quasi-static. So it goes very, very slowly and there are very robust arguments due to Samir Mathur, who is at Ohio State, he was previously in TIFR, right. So our countrymen are very much involved in this. I mean, I think the most robust arguments come from Samir. And uh, what, what he says is that you can tamper with this process a little bit, etc. But finally, no matter what you do, basically the black hole evaporates completely as long as you trust your theories and you are left with thermal radiation. Now the black hole could have been formed, right? When you formed it, it, you formed it through collapse. You just had matter and it collapsed from the black hole. That matter could have been in a pure quantum state. Thermal uh, ensembles, thermal states are mixed quantum states. So it looks like you are having evolution from something which is pure to something which is mixed. And this is called the information loss problem, a loss of unitarity, a loss of information. So does this happen, does this not happen? This is a puzzle and one wonders whether somehow quantum gravity can come to the rescue. For that I need a space-time diagram which I do not have time to, 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 to tell you about. Um, let me just uh, go on. So to summarize, GR is incomplete in itself due to singularities. Quantum mechanics often resolves class, singular classical behavior. Think of the hydrogen atom, right? Where actually, in, you know, things would have, there's no stability, right? You had an electron, you had a proton, you would have radiation and could just fall in and we would not be here. So everything is stabilized due to some weird quantum mechanical uh, things which give you stable orbits which are bound. So maybe there is a way in which, you know, this singular 1 over r square blow up at r equal to 0. Similarly, maybe quantum mechanics can cure the singularities of classical GR. And secondly, there is a mysterious connection between GR thermodynamics and quantum field theory, which suggests that black hole is an entropy and it suggests that black holes evaporate with information loss. So at every stage, we are, we are using well-known principles of quantum mechanics and gravity, but at the end, we find a contradiction. So can quantum gravity provide an understanding of the origin of entropy? Is there something you can count? Somebody had asked, Pramod, someone had asked, is there something you can count which gives you uh, the area's entropy, right? And since it's all geometrical, you would think that, and since you have a finite counting where usually these finite things come modulated by h bar, right? Uh, you count cells in momentum space or whatever. So here you would think that really quantum gravity maybe has something to do with the microscopic uh, uh, understanding of, of, of entropy. And can it also solve the information loss problem? So this um, I maybe can talk in coffee time or something as to this requires a space time diagram. So maybe this is a good time to, to stop because uh, um, uh, I mean there was one more part where uh, which was a general part which was quantum gravity and observations which will take me 5 to 7 minutes. and then it will complete. Then I, I mean, I am not talking about my work, but that is okay. It does not matter. I can just conclude or not or whatever, whatever the, the I mean, chair says. Uh,
we will do how can i <laughs> yeah so if you if you allow me then maybe what i can do is i can finish this part and then just stop right and then i would if there is interest then i can tell you about or whatever you want to do because if we break now then maybe difficult so we can also do this that let me finish this part then let any people who are uh, want lunch more than a uh, very dubious subject knowledge of quantum gravity they can go for lunch and the other people who want to stay on i can even if there are two or three people i don't mind oh there's oh yeah there's one more talk here yeah, i forgot i'm sorry whoever is the speaker my apologies i'm very sorry so what do i do you just decide and i will do So I, maybe I uh, Maravan, yeah. maybe if you can like take one or two minutes to see wh what is this. No, no, I, I didn't mean to uh, yeah. say all your subject in two minutes, <laughs> but like so, uh, so wh no, no wh what is the like uh, loop quant loop quantization mean basically? Like, is it possible to say it uh, something? Yes, no, no. Uh, yes, I can jump to that. E e uh, yeah, maybe if you want me to jump, but again. Yeah, I think it will take too much time. No, okay. I think better yeah, that yeah, I stop. Yeah, maybe then here. I can ask you separately. Yeah, you can ask me separately. <laughs> I think maybe I should stop, and I don't know what to do then. After that, uh. <laughs> yeah, only thing I'll afternoon I am disappearing somewhere because there's a how some commitment I have. Morning I can give no problem. Uh, morning occupied. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I have to go somewhere to yeah, beyond. Yeah, somewhere I have to go. Nail Mangla side, I have to go tomorrow. Okay, then. Okay. Sure, sure. Sorry, I I, I shouldn't have gone so much. I mean, I didn't know. I thought it will go. Uh, this material actually is only twenty <laughs> slides and uh, should have been over in forty minutes. But it's nice that that there are questions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so so let me just say the following uh, in couple of minutes. First, okay, okay. The first thing I wanted to say, just you cut me short in two minutes. Okay, I'll take one minute to say this and one minute to say about LQG and then stop. So the first thing I wanted to say is that, as I said, if you look at different parts of the sky, they are all homogeneous. But if you go back in time, there is a finite time from which everything has started, and it turns out. that these different parts of the sky have not had enough time to interact early at the big bang or right up there's not enough time for them to homogenize and look exactly the same so in order to cure this there was an idea which was inflation and what that it was a concocted idea where soon after the big bang the universe expanded hugely so that patches which were small and equilibrated right now are huge patches which we see on the sky as a result of this things which were very very small are now inflated to big size and due to the intricate way in which all this thing works if you are lucky with the amount of inflation which is just a parameter if you have too much inflation you can't see anything but if you are just lucky with the amount of inflation you might be able to see planck scale sizes which have now inflated to the largest angular sizes on the cmbr you might be able to see signs of planck scale physics in the cmbr in particular if there is a bounce instead of a singularity you might be able to see signs of that over there there are a series of anomalies at large angular scales with large error bars in the cmbr a family of these anomalies seem to be explained through these bounce loop quantum gravity uh, bounce kind of things that is one the other thing i wanted to say is loop quantum gravity itself it's a very conservative approach it does exactly what sadik advocates it writes down theory einstein's theory which is written in lagrangian form it writes it in hamiltonian form it looks at the variables corresponding to the position and the momentum in this case they turn out to be the spatial geometry and its rate of change does some canonical transformations to make the theory look simpler tries to find the representations of these q's and p's so that the commutators are i h bar and then tries to write down the hamiltonian of the theory as an operator and see how the evolution goes so that is exactly what the loop quantum gravity effort is the problem is that lot of new tools have to be uh, uh, invented because 
most other theories for example, uh, theory of electromagnetism on, on flat space time, the modes which are there, creation annihilation modes, they are obtained, the things which you quantize are obtained by Fourier transforming with respect to the inertial coordinates. You take your field Fourier transform. But Fourier transform only makes sense, inertial coordinates make sense when you have a fixed flat space time. Now you have no space time at all, space time is dynamical. So you have to find quantization techniques, invent them which apply in the absence of any fixed space time, right. So this is a huge thing, the kinematics is difficult finding this representation that has been done well understood in uh, loop quantum gravity. The dynamics is much harder because these Hamiltonians are very complicated operators and you have to build them again without recourse to any background space time. So this is an open problem, this is a problem which I have been working on probably through my entire career and especially over the last 10 years where I have made some breakthroughs for what is called Euclidean gravity which is gravity in four space dimensions. The next step is gravity in three space and one time dimension which is the physically realistic case. But uh, the work is technical and finally after staring at the problem for long enough 15, 10, 15 years I have made a breakthrough which I am very happy about and uh, I cannot share exactly what that is with you but just to say that I am happy and grateful to RRI for allowing me to you know just concentrate on one problem for almost my entire career and being patient with me. So thank you all for your attention and uh